G'day you legends, thanks for tuning in to Supercharge Mojo. My guest today is Emily Sander, she's a leadership coach. She's written two books, Hacking Executive Leadership and An Insider's Perspective on the Chief of Staff. We had an awesome chat, she threw down some pretty cool challenges at the end of our conversation and let's get into it. What exactly is, is your position and what does the role of chief of staff entail? <laughs> Great question. So chief of staff in business, so there's the military chiefs of staff, political chiefs of staff, but uh, in business, it's the strategic right-hand partner to the CEO. Um, so I look after the CEO and the executive leadership team and make sure that they're focused and prioritized correctly and resourced correctly and can go after those priorities. So that's that's one big job. Um, another one is uh, information flow throughout the organization. So making sure information is getting from leadership down to the organization, from the employees on each team up to leadership, so they're getting accurate information, and then across the organization. So if people are in silos and don't talk to each other, bad things happen. And if they do talk to each other and have those communication channels built in, things go a lot better. <laughs> so those uh, those are just some of the very few things that uh, I do as chief of staff. And I, I like to call it the Swiss Army Knife or the SWAT team member of the leadership team. That's a really interesting position to be in. Um... It all trickles down from the top, right? But it sounds like you're very much, as you say, in the strategic position of keeping that all flowing. Yes. And one of the key characteristics of a chief of staff is they don't have a functional area. Instead, they see across the entire organization. So they see like f finance, sales, operations, marketing, all these different things, and they can connect the dots um, across the entire organization. Well, that must have exposed you to must have been pretty it must be pretty cool to be exposed to so many different aspects of a of a company what what, what is the company exactly just to clarify yeah so it's a digital marketing company um so we provide uh websites and digital marketing to to different businesses and yes i have learned this is like a mini mba in business um i have learned so much and uh our ceo often goes uh emily like we have this random project that doesn't really fit in any other group um you don't know anything about this go figure it out and i'm like okay so <laughs> i have to be resourceful and uh just do my best and uh put things together but you know i like that i get bored easily so having having a new a new project or essentially um a new role every six to 12 months is is uh mm. exciting for me so often you kind of hit with things on the fly and have to kind of learning oh, yeah. by doing and, and oh, yeah. throw yourself into it adaptability is the name of the game in adaptability all sorts of ways. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um have you always been in this type of position or what what led you to it to it yeah no i haven't always been a chief of staff i i i went into the business world um and i fell into a gig at amazon and the Amazon was hush hush. Uh, I couldn't tell anyone about it, NDAs and all that. And it turned out that it was, I was a tester for the original Kindle device. And okay. so um, I was on that team. And then that kind of led to a variety of different roles and companies and my, and my career kind of unfolded, uh, unfolded from there. But uh, no, no deliberate, I want to be a chief of staff when I grow up. So we're talking like the original Kindle model. Mm hmm yeah. Oh, wow. In its very prim sort of primitive stages. Yeah, we had like the prototype of the device. And basically, we we go through a workflow and try to read books and we try to break it. And so we document errors <laughs> or formatting things or when this button didn't work um, and what workflows were most intuitive, things like that. So um, I was testing it. I wasn't an engineer on it. I didn't create the Kindle. Um, someone said, oh, Emily, you created the Kindle. And I was like, if I created the Kindle, <laughs> I would be in a much different spot than, than right now. But uh, I did test it, and it's um, it's been a lot of fun to see uh, how that's progressed and how how ubiquitous that is now. Because um, I do remember trying to explain it to friends and family, and I was like, "It's a it's a e reader. It's a book <laughs> e reader." And they're like, "What?" So now everyone knows what a Kindle is. 
Yeah, well, yeah, I imagine for its time it was uh, it was hard to understand at the time, but it all makes sense now. Um, uh, it's just I, I had a th- I lost my train of thought for a sec. Um, you were, I, I guess, in your position of chief of staff, um, you ha- you have to communicate in a very literal and clear way so that uh, communication lines don't get lost. I guess you kind of have to cut to the chase. Um, it's interesting being here in Germany because Germany is very, a very direct place. And as an Australian, we're renowned for kind of dancing around things a little <laughs> bit, um, particularly when things uh, can be a bit uncomfortable. We're like, let's just go have a beer. It'll be all right. It's all good intention. But living in Germany, I've seen the kind of other end of the spectrum, which is very literal and direct communication, sometimes perhaps a little too much. So I'm trying to find a nice middle, um, I think a middle between the two from what I've experienced. But how much does that come into play in terms of like keeping the the communication open and, and I guess allowing people to be heard? Absolutely. All of what you just said is is a key part of it. And I would say find the middle ground, yes, but also um, you need all of it. So you, sometimes you need to be direct. Sometimes you need to be in the middle and sometimes you need to be like, let's go for a beer and everything's fine. And let's just kind of dance around it and get to it and in our own time and on your own terms. So you have to be able to flex into different communication styles, uh, given who you're talking to and who your audience is and what their preference of communication is and also the situation. So, Hey, you know, if our servers went down, I'm going to be very direct about what needs to happen. You know, all of our websites are down. Our customers don't have service. Like that's a, that's a more of a direct communication. If it's something where I'm working with an executive team member on a long-term kind of let's build this habit or let's keep this in mind um, type of thing, you keep falling over here, but we want to, we want you over here. That might be, you know, weeks, months, years of just, you know, conversations and touching base and checking in on that. So it's, uh, it's very situational. And, um, mm-hmm. and that's, again, why I like it, because it forces me or it or it or it gives me an opportunity to uh, think thought to be thoughtful and also deliberate about how I'm communicating. Again, it comes down to adaptability and, um, mm-hmm. and yeah, you can't, treat every situation the same or apply a template across the board you'd have to deal with people and individuals and situations as they arise absolutely and i think that's a good kind of rule of thumb for anyone to go by it's certainly imperative in chief of staff role but anyone i think if they're operating in a team or they're interacting with uh, people in their community or even family saying okay what does this situation call for and it might not be um, you know, direct and loud and boisterous. I always say, if if all you have in your tool belt is a hammer, then everything looks like a nail, and so you have to have more tools in your tool belt. <laughs> that's a that's a good one. I'm gonna use that. You know, not particularly particularly here. Um, have you found uh, being in the position you're in? Have have you found you've carried aspects? of that into your own life? Does it kind of carry across or is it a very, very separate thing? No, I think, I think, you know, we're holistic beings. So what we do at work affects outside and and vice versa. Um, I think that seeing the bigger picture. So chief of staff is really cool because it forces you to see the entire picture and it forces you to, uh, to zoom out and go to the 30,000 foot view and be very strategic. And then also move from strategic to tactical, to very in the weeds, brass tacks, I have to do this, jump in and help do this. And I think um, that that uh, distinction and that difference in flexing and adapting to that has helped me in my personal life. Um, and also helped me like, for instance, with my own business, where it's like, okay, let me zoom out and see what's what's going to be the most strategic thing for me to do this year. And then, okay, now I have to dive into the business and actually put these things in place and do them. Uh, so I love, yeah, I love kind of the creative resourcefulness that I can, I can bring from uh, that role into other places. To be able to see things from that zoomed out perspective and then narrowing the focus, that's, that's quite a, quite a big skill to have. Yes, it's it's tough because most people live in one or the other. So I've been around like founders and entrepreneurs 
who are like all up here, like, you know, clouds and vision and ideas all the time. And if you ask them to execute on anything, they're lost. And so they need someone like me who is like very organized and can put things um, in, to work on the ground. And then you have some people who like, uh, I, you know, I don't see the big picture. I don't have a vision for that, but I can organize that. I can uh, bring people together for that. I can build people process tools for that. And I don't mind getting my hands dirty. Um, and so you need, you need all people to, to make a world and uh, to make a business run. Mm. I've, I've worked in some companies where I've seen some call it more uh, toxic environments develop. And I just think through mainly through, um, you know, people not really being heard or, or generally not being being respected or appreciated or um, having an awareness of the value in what they do. Like it, it's complicated, but I have witnessed some toxic kind of cultures arrive. But in a lot of these smaller companies and things, there hasn't been a person like yourself across the board kind of having this overall, you know, there's just been like a, a clear hierarchy and 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 not really anybody to um harmonize the thing as a whole i guess i guess the question is how do you think a company can avoid avoid that kind of culture creeping in yeah i mean toxic culture if you walk into a room sometimes i would walk into a room and you could just kind of feel, feel like the tension yeah no one would look at you and people were very heads down and it's like oh i know the culture here so yes i mean i think as chief of staff as the as the title indicates uh i was taking care of the staff and that was primarily the executive leadership team but also the rest of the management team and the rest of the organization as a whole and one of the one of the fun things that i got to do was um these these listening tours so basically you know at certain intervals i would go and i would interview different groups so like our mid-level managers and then at one point everyone in the in the company i would just go around and have one-on-one -on -one conversations with everyone just to to see what was on their mind and what they liked about um, the company and their team and their and their boss and their role and what they didn't like um, and those were just me, you know, listening. I wasn't trying to to, to do anything per se, but um, I think to your point, um, even if someone doesn't agree with the direction of the company or maybe a, a certain decision their boss made, if they felt like they were heard and listened to, they're they're more inclined to be like, okay, Emily, you know, she respects me. Um, I know that she knows how I feel about this, and she also took the time to you know walk me through why we're going in this direction instead okay like most people are are fine with that when you get the we're telling you what to do and we're sending lightning bolts from up on high and we're not you know giving you any any input or any time of day or even you know you know pretend to pay attention to you and lip service that's where you get in trouble so i would encourage leaders and anyone really to to really be intentional about listening and seeking out seeking out others um, for their opinion with curiosity. And I always assume that I don't know everything because I don't, and also that I can learn from people. So if you go into every conversation with, I don't know everything and um, I get to learn something, then those those conversations unfold in a certain way and tend to go well. Mm, Intentional is a, a good word. Um, there's a lot of uh, I think the face-to-face -face thing is important as well because I've just noticed there's there's so many things these days of you know online surveys and peer reviews and you spend all this time kind of writing stuff but nothing really beats like a face-to-face -face, uh, honest conversation. Right, and I would I would encourage people to do um, as many methods as they can because some people prefer you know uh, writing. True. A lot of people mm. prefer um, face to face, and that I, you know it's easier for me to just say it to you, and you can pick up my tone and pick up my meaning that way. We've done um, at another place I was at, we did pulse surveys, which was literally like one or one or two questions, and people would just get that in their email or get that in their Slack channel, and they would respond to it. So something easy and quick, but it's just kind of taking a quick pulse. And getting the temperature and if you um, see those trends 
across the company, you can kind of say, oh, 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 okay, we need to address this or we need to um, explain this more, something like that. But, but all of those can be helpful. And I would certainly um, say doing the face-to-face -face is important because we're humans and we like social interaction and, and, a, and a human face to respond to is important too. It's true though. Some people might be more comfortable writing. Um, so yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, you've written a book. If you wouldn't mind introducing it where you can find it, there's a few concepts in there I'd like to address, which I think the names are pretty, pretty cool. So where can people find the book? Yes. So I think you're referring to my first book, which the is first Hacking one. Executive Leadership. Yes. Yep. Um, and they can, you can find that on Amazon. It's, there's a Kindle version, of course, there's a, a audible version for people who are busy. Um, and then I have a, a chief of staff book I wrote called the insider's perspective of the chief of staff, which is all about, all about the role. But I think the frameworks you're, you're alluding to are in the first one. Yeah. The first one. So we have the swizzle concept. <laughs> is that, yes. so, that's something you've come up with? Yes. So, um, I was running around one day and I blurted out that word because I just couldn't think of anything else. And so I made that up, but it became a thing and it became a thing that everyone used. And what that means is, is it's a way to be creative, creatively resourceful. So it's a way to use all facets of your life to, to, um, be a, to make things better. And it's kind of like what we talked about before, which is, you know, what aspects of the chief of staff role do you use in other areas of your life? So I'll give you an example, and this this will go back to our, our adaptability theme. So I was listening to a podcast with Floyd Mayweather, mm -hmm. and he is a champion boxer. I, I don't watch boxing. I don't do boxing. I don't know anything about that. But he was on this podcast, and the hosts were interviewing him, and they were trying to get him to say, like, what's what's the one thing that makes you – the champion, you know, what's, is it your footwork, is it your diet? Yeah. yeah, is it like, what, what is it? And he finally said like, it's, it's none of that. Um, it's my adaptability. It's my ability to adapt, to adapt to any opponent, to any round. And he said to any punch better than anyone else. And that's what makes me a champion. And I sat there, I was driving and I was like, oh my gosh, you know, I, I'm not a boxer. I don't do that, but I can absolutely lift and shift this concept into my world, which is business and apply that all day long, all day long to business and leadership. And so I swizzled that concept um, of adaptability from the sports world into the business world. So if you think about, okay, what are some principles or lessons or frameworks or anything where, hey, I can actually use that over here, that's, that's swizzling and it's being creatively resourceful. That's an awesome analogy, actually, I can relate to that because I was actually sparring once um, with two very different styles of um, martial arts and and I was I was struggling to adapt and when I started to actually be be more flexible to the other person's style it was more, more beneficial but yeah taking that like integrating that um, concept yeah that's 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 very cool and I like the word swizzle as well <laughs> <laughs> it was just, it's what, uh, it's what came out. I was talking to my team about, we had a PowerPoint presentation we had to put together that afternoon for like an all company. And I said, guys, we have the content in three other, other decks we've, we've used before, just swizzle those together and make a new one. And basically <laughs> I meant like, take the best slides from each of the three decks or most relevant, reformat it and put it in order and swizzle it together for, <laughs> for our uh, PowerPoint this afternoon. Yeah, cool. Uh, one of the other is the the failure loop. Mm, yes, that is a framework to basically rethink failure. So basically turn it on its head, because when most people hear failure, they have a negative connotation. I don't want to fail. Like, I don't want to be a failure. And I actually talk about how important it is for leaders to intentionally fail. And what that means is you've, you've got to put yourself in a position to be outside of your comfort zone and you have to be willing to be wrong. You got to be willing to look stupid and willing to fall short and do that over and over and over again. And if you do that in the right way, you actually take the learning and take the lesson and you use that to propel yourself um, forward. So the failure loop is, uh, I have a graph in my book, but it's a chain of individual loops that are connected and they go up and to the right. 
and up into the right is the direction of progress and that's the way you want to go overall but in the individual loop there's a section where you go back down into the left and that's typically considered a failure event so um oh i i messed up on that presentation or um this decision did not go the way i intended it to or anything like that and if you stop there and you go oh i failed and you kind of like throw up the flag and declare declare yourself a failure and drown in your pools of pessimism that's one way to go instead if you take the learning and apply it going forward um you just propelled yourself up the the failure loop in the direction of progress and so when i talk about this it's there's some tactical and practical things you can implement with it it's a lot to do with your mindset um, and saying i want to seek out these strategic places for me to fail and for me to push myself and grow and step outside of my comfort zone and i always say you know the 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 quotes i love are um i'm successful because i fail more times than others even try mm. and uh and the other one is um i do today what you're unwilling to do so tomorrow i can do what you can't so it's putting yourself in these positions yeah but if you have that mentality and if you think about it if you do that failure loop or you know success loop over and over and over again in your life you will be a very successful person you will progress in whatever you are doing and um that that failure moment is actually a mark of a successful person so i've come full circle on this myself i was terrified of being wrong, especially in front of people. And now um, I'm seeking out places where, you know, I'm, I might not be the best at the beginning, but I will make myself good by putting myself out there over and over and over again. And then I will become, I will become good. That's awesome. I love it. Uh, the failure, failure comes up a lot on the show and, and, you know, I, yeah. I always refer to it more as, as lessons as opposed to to failures but but like you say also having the courage um in meetings and stuff to it takes courage to actually say hey you know what i don't know but i'm willing to to learn as opposed to like staying quiet and pretending um that we do know something but i, I was talking about it this morning just because in germany it's kind of daily failure with the language um and at first i got i used to get quite uncomfortable with the daily failure but now i've i've seen it just as an awesome kind of little way uh, for personal growth daily, because there's not often a day where I'm in a kind of, because the language is complex and um, yeah, I, I publicly bomb and fail every day here. Uh, and it used to get me down at times, but now I see it actually as a, as a massive tool for growth as well as other things, playing music and performance and stuff. So I've like, you have, have embraced that concept. I think it's, um, you, you can only benefit from the willingness to try and the willingness to fall flat on one's face. I love that example. It's a fun example because, um, I bet you, if you compare yourself now and your language abilities to when you first started, it's, it's probably, night and day different yes yeah and pe people say that to me and i struggle to see the context because i can't gauge myself mm -hmm. but i mean when i first came here in my mid-30s and like it was a struggle to order a uh, order a loaf of bread i was like wow am i too am i too old to like just dive into this whole thing but i you know i was building a life here um so yeah i'm sure i'm sure in context you know there's not a lot of situations where i I can't handle myself, you know, and I mean, I can even go into like some of the heavy, like finance, go into a tax office and get, get asked the questions that I wow. need. And I mean, tax in any language, right. could be pretty daunting, <laughs> let alone in, in one that's not your first. Um, but yeah, it's really cool. It's just a little example. I just know, I just had a moment where I was like, wow, this is actually like kind of daily growth. If, if exactly what you say, if you frame it that way, as opposed to letting it like beat you down and saying, how am yes. I ever going to, you know? Because if you were to stop and say, I'm only going to speak English because I, I'm bad at that, you, you know, that's, that's one way to go. But instead you're saying, no, like I have every, every day I have an opportunity to learn and I take that and I use it. So if you use it well, um, then, then you're going to be in good shape. And the, I'll share something with you. So please, 
I, I, uh, this is a personal example for me. I used to be terrified of being a podcast guest because that was public speaking and that was scary. And if you go back on the internet and you find some of my first ones, you will hear that and you will see that. Um, and it is much different than now. Um, and I, I actually last week found some notes from 18 months ago, they were planning notes. And it was, you know, being a podcast guest was on my plan, but it was uh, audio only, small audiences. So when I mess up, I don't do it in front of a lot of people and friendly hosts. And that was my criteria. And now I'm like, video like big audiences that like all sorts of hosts like all sorts of people like get me out there and uh i read that and i was like whoo mm. that's a good reminder that's yeah, that's abs- personal growth so um, absolutely yeah. absolutely no you have you have um, a real comf- comfortability i hope i pass the test as friendly host i hope i take yes the- you do <laughs> <laughs> you're awesome uh the next the next one is the the three circles framework Yes, this is around decision making. So um, it makes you a better decision maker. So three circles are three circles in a in a horizontal line, and they're a math equation. So it's an easy math equation. Circle one plus circle two equals circle three. Circle one is the external event that kind of lands in your lap. So it could be um, an email that you get, or maybe um, you're in a team meeting and you're leading the meeting and then someone, you know, starts to starts to be upset and starts to shout and starts to um, disrupt the meeting. So that's that's circle one. Um, circle three is your desired outcome. So what you want to have happen in this. So you skip from circle one and you do a hop, skip and a jump to circle three. And you say, what do I want to have happen here? OK, in the meeting example, I want to calm that person down and get the get the meeting back on track back on agenda okay then i reverse engineer to circle two which is what do i need to say what do i need to do or what do i need to not say what do i need to not do in this situation to give me the highest likelihood to get to circle three so circle one plus circle two equals circle three you go circle one external event Circle three, what do I want to have happen here? Back to circle two, what do I need to say or do to make that happen? So you can use that in a kind of reactive mode like that team meeting. You can also use it in a proactive, um, intentional way. So let's say you're going into a team meeting and you say, okay, I have a few minutes. Let me let me think through um, uh, the external event is still the team meeting. And then what do I want to have happen? Okay, at the end, I want people to feel informed and encouraged. Okay, informed and encouraged. So if they want, if they're going to be informed and encouraged by the end, what do I need to say or do in the meeting? And it might be, oh, um, you know, I need to give a company update at the beginning. And then I actually uh, want them to talk amongst themselves and just have ideas and see that they're part of this too. That'll, that'll help them feel encouraged. So I'm going to do a brief update and then I'm going to let them discuss this topic, something like that. So that's just some quick examples of, of three circles. Yeah. I like, I like the notion of filling in the pieces in the middle, you know, point A, you know, you know, C what, what's involved practically in B to try and try and get to there to C. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And some some key points is sometimes you have to do in circle two, you have to do something you don't feel like doing. Um, So in that first example, you might feel like yelling back at the person and being like, look, like, uh, Jason, we've talked about this 12 times. I don't know why you're bringing this up again. I don't know why you're doing this in front of everyone, but that's not going to get you or that's likely not going to get you the outcome you want. So sometimes it's doing uh, it's doing what you need to do. To get to circle three, not what you feel like doing. Mm. And the, the other key component of that is defining your circle three. So a lot of people will skip that step altogether. They're like, something happened and I'm going to have this knee jerk emotional reaction um, and whatever happens, happens. But there, there's no there's no thoughtfulness around what do I want to have happen here? Mm. So I think that's an important step too. So it's a more strategic approach to things that can happen quite spontaneously or randomly that you that you have to deal with yes yes so it kind of combines the adaptability part that we that we have and also um the situational leadership and then really defining what what do i want out of this situation 
um, not not what do I feel like doing all the time. So you could also take that into situations in in personal life, right? Like how do, I've got from this, that's what I would like the outcome to be and how do I make that happen? Absolutely. I mean, um, it can be used in, in any sort of personal relationship, right? So uh, if uh, I, had a, I had a client who kind of went into the personal realm on one session and we used three circles where they were having an argument with their significant other um and it was like okay what is your ultimate concern here what's your circle three and it's not being right it's not you know digging in and turning the knife it's hey i want to preserve the health and longevity of this relationship i care about this person and so in that case circle two is let me um listen let me uh hear what they're what they're upset about let me try to connect with them and meet them where they're at could be let me apologize, even if I didn't think I did anything wrong, but if apologizing keeps the peace and gets me to circle three, then that's what I need to do. Um, so it absolutely can be used in, in a whole bunch of different areas. I had someone, um, I was giving this example and they got really into it and really riled up. And I think I was giving, uh, I don't remember the exact example, but they were like, uh, is there like a secret circle four where we can take <laughs> someone outside and punch them? <laughs> it's like, uh, yes. no, like three circles does not advocate violence, but um, I appreciate your creativity. <laughs> There's an emergency circle in case. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you proceed. drop through circle two into circle four. Um, proceed to four. <laughs> um, there are some concepts and I like the way that you've, you've uh, kind of, package them or call it, you know, like a tangible, practical way. Um, and yeah, they sound applicable to, to a lot of things. Yes. So I try to make them one kind of visual because I'm a visual learner. So mm. all of these have a little graph or image component in the book. And then I also wanted to, like you just said, it's great that you said that because universal frameworks. So it's not, you know, in this specific business situation, here's what you do because that's that's uh, that's too specific and it's, it's not going to fit everyone. Instead, I said, what are the main concepts and frameworks that if someone has, they can apply to a whole bunch of different situations? And so if they know about that and if they get good at that, they can deploy them in a whole bunch of different ways. So I really wanted to go uh, for those types of frameworks. So thank you for saying that. Yeah, no, interesting. Um, have you got any interest in politics or... As a chief so, of staff? <laughs> no, it was it's funny because I was actually a poli sci major in, in college. Uh, and right after university, I flew from Washington State to Washington, DC, the capital. I spent a summer there, um, which was which was a great experience and a kind of a, a good life experience. But um, I moved into business and um, I'm still very, you know, uh, informed and, and watch politics at the national and local level and worldwide level. Um, but yeah, I would, I would not, I would not go into that now. <laughs> yeah, that was my, yeah, I guess that was my, my question. Uh, something I like to do on the show is have guests offer listeners some kind of challenge. It doesn't have to be anything huge. Mm -hmm. I, I've done a lot of them myself on this, the first series I actually did 50 and they were like really small, small, but significant things. Um, and there were consistencies between them all, um, just little things parts of the day, you know, to, you know, devoting to a set block of time or trying habit change, all these sort of things. So if there's anything that uh, springs to mind from all your experience that the listeners could try, that'd be awesome. Yes, I think I have three in mind. So the first one would be kind of on that, on that failure loop piece. Um, ask your question, ask the question, if I knew that I couldn't fail, what would I do? So if I knew that anything I, I started would be successful, I, I have to work and put in the time, but I know it's going to turn out. What would you do? What would you do differently than you are doing today? Um, and then I, you know, the the second part of that would be, you know, take one step in that direction. So if you're thinking of starting a new business, then okay, you know, research that a bit. Um, go to a networking event and learn more about that. Talk to a friend who's done something similar. So so that's one. Um, ask yourself that. 
Um, the just second say, one, sorry, that's a great way to frame it. Yeah, I haven't really heard it framed like that, but just yeah, simply ask if if I was to, and try you know in the question of trying to eliminate any of that fear that creeps in and just go, hey, what what would it be if if you know it's a good way to frame it. And even if you just ask yourself that question over and over, your mind will start to to mm. change and you'll be like, mm, you'll be a little bit more open to it. And, and then the very small ta tangible step toward it, not something, you know, not getting overwhelmed by the huge thing, but just something very small and, and manageable that you can step in that direction with. Yeah. Don't quit your job and, you know, start a new business uh, on a whim. Um, there's another example like on that. So uh, if you're trying to exercise more and you decide to go walking in the morning, but sometimes it's cold and dark outside. The night before, what's what's one simple thing that you can try to do? It's put your shoes and put your clothes out um, and have them all set out for you. So just little, like small, small steps like that. Like it's the one little thing I can do just to make it a little bit easier on myself. Like, okay, if my shoes are right there and my clothes are right there, let me just do this and get out there. And then you're walking. It helps eliminate any... Uh chance of talking yourself out of it if if, yes. if you're ready to go yeah yeah, yeah. just yeah. do a baby step uh, yeah. do, do a baby step that makes you go oh that's easy like i could do that like my bite size bite size chunk it down to something where it's like oh like yeah i can do that that's easy yeah um this second yeah yeah second one would be uh take inventory of your belief set so your belief set, everyone is carrying around a belief set, and it's kind of like contact lenses in your eye. So you often forget that they're, forget that they're there, but they color or tint everything that you see. Um, and so I often say, um, you know, people carry beliefs from their childhood, and you know, we're just we're just given those by circumstance and by our upbringing. And some of those serve us very well. Like if you were raised to have integrity and treat people with respect, like that's amazing. Like, you know, maybe keep those belief sets. If uh, you had something um, that isn't serving you now, you might want to replace that. So if it was in your house, when someone yelled at you, you yelled back and whoever yelled the loudest won the, won the argument, won the day, does that serve you now? Um, another example is, you know, as a little kid going to school, your parents might have said, hey, hey, little Billy, don't talk to strangers on your way to school. Perfectly sound advice for a parent. If Billy is older and Bill is now walking into a networking event uh, at his work, don't talk to strangers is not what you want to be doing. So that's just a little example of how these hidden beliefs um, that we carry on from early on can still be with us. So take inventory of, of your belief set. One of the easiest ways to do that is observe your behavior. So beliefs lead to feelings and feelings lead to action. And so if you take the observable action or how you behaved and you reverse engineer that and say, okay, uh, I did that in the meeting. What was I feeling? right before I did that. And then mm, what did I have to believe about that situation for me to feel like that and do that? And so you kind of reverse engineer and go back to the root cause. So I love this. It'll, it'll literally change your world and change your lens. Um, so it's a really useful thing uh, people can do. The third one, I would say, you kind of mentioned this before, but setting, setting some time aside a day, and it might be for a, a mindfulness practice. And you can call this whatever you want, like you can go for a walk, you can do meditation, you can pray, whatever you want to call it, but setting some time aside where you just ground yourself and center yourself um, and get really present uh, is important. If you would have told me to do this five, 10, 15 years ago, I would be like, no, no way. That's a waste of time. I don't have time for that. I'm a, I'm a busy professional. I'm a high powered executive. Um, and then I got to reading about different leaders and hearing interviews with a whole bunch of really, really successful, like high, high net worth people. And most of them had a mindfulness practice. And I was like, wait, wait a minute. Um, I remember hearing Ray Dalio, who is like, you know, a, a, you know, multi-millionaire and, and very successful in business. And he said he meditates twice a day, twice a day. 
Um, and so I've developed a, a mindfulness practice and it's changed, it's changed everything. The quality of my work all throughout the day is better. The quality of my interactions and communications with other people is better. And when, when bad things happen or when something unexpected happens, I can see it coming at me, but in slow motion. So mm. before it was like, oh, it's right here. Like it's a panic, you know, code red, whatever. And now it's like, oh, okay, this is happening. Let me maybe apply the three circles and figure out what, I, what do I want to have happen? What do I need to do right now? And uh, it's, it's much easier to handle and I'm, and I'm more effective at handling that. It's kind of like, um, you know, the movie uh, Matrix, The Matrix? Mm. I was it's kind of like when Neo holds yeah, up yeah. his hand and yeah. he stops the bullets and then he makes them drop. It's like, yeah. I feel like I can do that now for anything that's, that's coming at me. So those would be, those would be the three. Um, ask yourself, what would you do today if you knew, to, if you, knew you couldn't fail? Um, take inventory of your belief set and uh, then develop some sort of, sort of mindfulness practice. Free for the price of one. Amazing. Oh, there we go. Triple threat. <laughs> no, but I love them all. They're, they're three awesome things. I mean, to do all three would just be be really awesome. That the yeah, the mindful thing, the mindfulness thing really is like a like a a circuit breaker, yet it's 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 so difficult for us to sometimes it's amazing how hard it is for us to just devote a couple of minutes out of a, a twenty thousand minutes in the day. It's it's really crazy when it's when it is so beneficial and that clarity you're talking of uh, I've experienced that too where I've actually done some meditation and then gone in, straight from that into a um like a martial arts exercise and it's exactly what you're saying it's everything's become slower and and uh there's more clarity in 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 dealing with it so can't um can't encourage it enough but those are three spectacular challenges you've offered there. So thank you for those. Yes. Thank you. Um, where can people find you? Yes. Yeah, so um, my website is the best place to go. So it's uh, www.nextlevel.coach. So next level, all one word dot coach. And they can find my, your links to the, my books and you can contact me there and learn more um, about coaching or about the chief of staff there. So um, check out my website and has all my social media links as well. So next level dot coach. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time. It's been, been a real pleasure. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me on and thank you for being a, a great host. <laughs> you don't have to be scared of. <laughs>